it's always humorous to hear being quoted, and, and I'm sitting here listening to that quote thinking, oh, that was pretty good. <laughs> That's when you know the Holy Spirit is in control, right? Well, I want to share a few things with you today, and I'm going to talk a little bit about my journey, just because the only reason why I'm talking about my journey is because it'll help you understand a little bit about what God has embodied in me in order to understand more what the message is for all of you. So as I talk to you about my journey, it seemed like in no matter what context God placed me in, it was never easy. And I began to, to wrestle with why this can't be easy. And obviously my theology was lacking at that time. Because everything is broken, nothing is going to be easy on this side of eternity, but it will be worth it if God is in it. And so I began to found, find purpose in my pain and also understand that this life is not about perfection, it is about perseverance. Eventually we will experience the fullness of perfection. That's something to look forward to. There will no longer be the brokenness that we live in now. But because that is not true, as your vice president so aptly said, that we're living in between, because we have not yet experienced the fullness, because we have not yet seen Christ face to face, we live in this realm in which what God calls us to do is persevere, to allow his presence to permeate all that is done, even when it is not going to live up to his standard ever. Because we live in a fallen world and because we are still not fully realizing the sanctification that he has placed within us. So I come back to Philippians 2, 12 and 13 many times in my life. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. But please do not forget verse 13. For it is God who works in you to will and to do of his good pleasure. And I began to realize this is not something that we do on our own. And one of the passages that God brought into my life at a very young age, I was 11 years old, and my sixth grade teacher challenged me to memorize John 15. And so I worked at it. It's a long chapter. I worked at it, worked at it, worked at it, and I had to stand in front of these adults that were judges, and I had to quote John 15. And then at the end, mind you, I'm 11 years old, then I had to also explain what it meant. And all I got was a stupid blue ribbon. I was ticked. <laughs> Because I was driven, I was ambitious, I had experienced childhood sexual abuse, and I self-medicated off adrenaline and ambition. Some people self-medicate through substances, but there are many ways that we learn to self-medicate. But what God was doing in my life at a young age was helping me understand this idea of abiding. I'm not alone. I don't ever have to be alone. When he says, I will never leave you or forsake you, God is not a liar. And he is faithful to that every moment of every day. There will never be a time on this side of eternity or the other side of eternity where he is not present. Whether we feel him, that's a whole other conversation. But he is present. And so my responsibility is to recognize his presence, recognize his life, recognize the fact that he is sharing his life with me and abide in that, remain in that. It's this concept of the watermelon seed is, is what I was. I was a watermelon seed for a long time. Whenever pressure in life came, when it came to my relationship with him, I was out of there. <laughs> I didn't want to feel that. I didn't want to be in that. But the problem was is that the pressure in life was developing God's purpose was for to develop in me this ability to stay, this ability to remain, this ability to persevere and not just try to shoot off to somewhere that I, I thought was safer for me or I thought would be better for me. But to trust him, to stay in that, to be faithful in that context. I am still struggling with that, as you will find out later, but that is something that he began to work in me early on. And I began to realize, whether it's because of my sinful choices or the sinful choices that people have committed against me, the bottom line is there are two trajectories of my life and two trajectories of all of our lives Steal, kill, and destroy, or abundant life in Christ. Satan is the accuser. The guilt and shame that we experience was never meant to be, Christ carried that for us. He never meant for us to carry that weight of guilt and shame. The weight of conviction is from God and the Holy Spirit. The weight of guilt and shame is from Satan. But I allow this guilt and shame, some of it legitimate guilt, some of it not. But it was weighing on my soul in ways that was sucking the life out of me. Sucking the life out of me is Satan's realm. Being life-giving is the realm of God. 
So we begin to, to think, and I started to evaluate myself, am I a person that sucks the life out of people or am I a life-giving person that speaks life and, and lives life in such a way that people walk away lighter, lighter in their soul, encouraged in their heart, um, transformed in their thinking. This also was ironically something that the vice president referred to as well. The statement made to Joseph, is that, that Joseph made to his brothers is that you intended this for evil. You aligned yourself to be a vessel of Satan to intend this for evil, to destroy me, to, to steal from me, to kill me, to take my life. And God intended it for good. That good was not just for the sake of Joseph. That good was, was to be good for many. It affected not only thousands of people, but it affected generations of people. That was God's plan. That was God's purpose. God brought a lot of unlikely friendships into my life. I've never been married. I don't have a family. I don't have children. And it, um, when I was, oh, I can't even remember exact age. In fact, I, honestly, I don't even want to tell you what age it was because then you'll start doing the math. But uh, a man came into my life, and uh, he was 92, and his name was Grandpa. And he lived with me the last year of his life, and he turned my life upside down. And uh, I didn't have family support in the area, and it was, a, it was a challenge trying to figure out how to help him have the quality of life that the image of God in him deserved. And there were times where I honestly said, I, I don't like you very much, but um, I like the God in you, so I'm going to hang in there. <laughs> that probably says more about me than it does about him. And it ended up being one of the most life-giving things I ever did. And I'm so grateful that he came into my life in such an intensive way, in such an intimate way, and lived life with me. But he was only there for a year, and then he passed away the day before Thanksgiving and turned my life upside down again, because now it was, it was learning to have life with Grandpa, now it's learning to have life without Grandpa. But it was a very unlikely friendship that developed. I had another friendship that developed. We played softball together in the city of Springfield, and she was very intimidating to me. Uh, she made me want to actually pee down my leg on a regular occasion. And she would come to me and say, I want to talk to you. And I'd say, oh, okay. <laughs> We'd have incredible conversations. And I began to understand as I listened to her that, that she had been through horrific things in her childhood. And I began to learn, and I was very bumpy. I don't even know why she put up with me half the time to try to know what it was like to be able to walk with her in ways that would be helpful. And I messed up on that a lot. But it was an unlikely friendship that God used to form me. As well as an unlikely friendship with a woman who was in the throes of crack addiction and, and prostitution, who, whose mother was in, in, in active addiction her whole life and passed away from active addiction. And she was now in prostitution and, and just trying to survive. She was a survivor. As critical as we want to be sometimes in, in, in terms of people's choices, sometimes it's, it's the only option for them to survive. They haven't chosen the other option, which is to end their lives. They're fighters. They're warriors. So many other friendships that God has brought into my life that have shaped me. And they've shaped me because they have chosen to share their life with me. I was in a realm of Christian education where we would wave at each other from a distance or we'd have lunch together, we'd sit down, and there, there were some intimate relationships developed from that standpoint, but I had no idea how, de how deprived my soul was of true intimacy where we shared life together. Similar to what Jesus Christ experienced with his disciples for three years. They didn't just sit down in church elbow to elbow for an hour or two or have a Bible study halfway through the week. They lived life together 24-7. I realize that from a practical standpoint, that's not always possible, but this idea of shared life seems to be a common theme throughout the scriptures and one that I had not truly had the courage to explore. These women invited me into that, and I'm forever grateful for that, as well as my grandfather. I told you about the abiding principle, and the only way we can share life with others in, in positive, healthy, life-giving ways is if we accept the life he wants to share with us. So I was very independent, again, very driven by ambition. I was involved in athletics and education, was going to go, you know, do whatever I had to do to, to live up to whatever anybody presented to me with success. As my dad would say, if they had a marbles contest, I'd be in it. I mean, I just wanted to do whatever I could do to get that feeling of success. 
And it wasn't true success, it was just this pseudo success and how it made me feel that I was pursuing. Again, medicating. So in that process, I began to realize that I needed much more healing myself. And I want to challenge each and every one of you because this is a, a, a prime time in your life to do this. Healing comes in layers. It's not going to be something that you just give yourself to for a weekend or like we always used to think growing up, if you grew up in the Christian community, it seemed like we always thought one week at camp in the summer was going to cure all of life's ills. We throw our stick in the fire, we watch the sparks go up, we sing kumbaya, and we're good for another year. It doesn't work that way. It is a day-to-day grinding process. It is a choice we make every morning to exist or to heal so we can live. And throughout that process, I began to ask God, you know, I've got education, I've got, you know, these are good things, they're not bad things. You know, I'm I'm, I'm teaching at the college level, I I feel good about, quote unquote, my accomplishments, but I was empty. And I was starting to really question, as passionate as I was about pouring into students' lives and saying, hey, here's a way that you can make a difference, I began to feel that I wasn't really able to give them what they truly needed. I didn't embody it, if that makes sense. And so I started Safe Harbor after some intensive time of focusing on my own healing journey because I knew starting a place like this where you're working with women coming out of trauma and substance abuse, having come out of a certain level of trauma myself, I knew that I could be triggered and I had to make sure that I was in as good a place as I possibly could be at that time that I needed to get more serious about it. So I spent that time doing that, and I highly encourage you to do the same. Seek out ways to heal. If there are things that have happened in your life that you have not verbalized, find safe people or a safe person. For me, it was a a godly counselor that I could, I didn't have to withhold anything. And it was also getting more and more in touch with the counselor within me, the Holy Spirit, the transparency I found myself having prayers where I was telling God things that I thought he wanted to hear instead of having true lament psalm prayers where they were putting it all out there before God, being very honest and open, whether it was jealousy over the fact that the wicked seemed to be succeeding or whether it was just pain and grief from deep, deep loss. They were putting it out there. And I had the Holy Spirit, the counselor within me, and was withholding. And I began to learn what that was in terms of the healing process and and allowing God to be present in my life, allowing him to share his life with me and then take the life that he shared with me and then share it with others. And that's what Safe Harbor came out of. Safe Harbor is a home for women coming out of trauma and substance abuse. It is a one to two year program. It allows for a a one year programming and then additional one year transition. And basically the, the, the tagline is a safe place to heal and that is not just a tagline for me. I had a hard time finding safe places to truly heal so that the life of Christ could become so much, could fill me versus all the other things that were filling my heart and mind and taking up space in my soul. And so I wanted women to have that that opportunity to be able to take some time out that had experienced deep trauma and there was static in their heads and they they just couldn't, they were having nightmares and night tremors and they, they couldn't find peace and they couldn't find space and they were trying to stay busy and pour into their kids and they just didn't have time to be able to set aside and say, I need to heal. I need some quiet in my heart and mind. I need some, I need some, some comfort and peace in my soul. I need to be able to focus on me for a minute so I really do have something to give to the people around me. And that was the, this is our, actually our, our second house. We have three houses. So the one is primarily for programming um, in the first six months, the second is programming for the second six, and that's when the, the women start to get jobs and think about employment. They start to dream about their lives a little bit. They start to think about what God may have called them to do instead of just being stuck in, in living moment to moment. And then there's a transition house. At some point, Safe Harbor was only encompassing half of what God had laid on my heart because the other half was community development. What happens is that we, don't, we think in terms of in In American culture, and especially evangelical culture, we think in terms of programs. Just look at our churches. So we we create these safe boxes, and we educate, 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 and we use programming even for reaching out. And there's nothing wrong with programming, but in the end, it really is about life. 
There's nothing in scripture that talks about programming. It talks about living life differently and the transformation of that. And programming can be a container. It can be a vessel for that. It can be a vehicle for that. Education can be that. So many things can be that. But in the end, what does it do to help us live life together well? What does it do to help us live in a context in which we may be the only light in a dark place? What does that look like? When I started Safe Harbor in 2011, I also moved into a home just a few blocks away from Safe Harbor. It was a long process for me. It was not pretty. It was actually, um, I kind of did a kicking and screaming, but I moved out of my safe rural neighborhood and I moved into the hood in Southwest Springfield. And I had a lot of people um, that felt that was a a poor decision on my part. It's not safe. It's not a, a good place for a single woman to be. And I started getting pushback, which was good for me because it was, it was not as intense at first. It was just, I don't know, you know, are you really thinking about this? And being a people pleaser, I, I would listen to that and I would start to question. I'd have all these doubts in my head and then finally God would just do, i just say, Lord, you got to show me because I, if this is what you want, then I, I know I need to do this whether I want to or not or whether I'm concerned about other people's concerns or not. I just need to know this is from you. And he gave me some pretty clear indications that this is what he wanted. So I I moved in and and started living life there. And shootings were happening and there there was drug activity. About three streets north of me is a primary place for, for violence. We've had a number of young men in particular that have been shot and killed there. And I started walking uh, the block. And I'd like to tell you that what I did is, is that I prayed and I, and I, I developed more compassion and I, I prayed for particular people and, and homes. And I'm not saying I didn't, that I never did that, but most of the time, you know what I did? I, I wept and said, God, please release me from this. I honestly felt like Jonah. <laughs> I don't want to be here. I don't want to do this. This is not comfortable in any way, shape, or form for me. It has created disequilibrium in every facet of my being. I don't feel like, my biggest frustration, because remember, I'm success-driven, right? My biggest frustration is I'm not seeing any fruit. I'm not seeing any results. I was an intercollegiate athlete, and I would look at the scoreboard at the end of the game, and that's what told me whether we succeeded or failed. I was an educator. I have a doctorate. I did, I did social science research, and, and it's, it's, it's statistics, it's research, it's proven. It's, it's, there was nothing like that here. It was just messy and brutal, and my soul was screaming. I didn't have the tools, the life skills to be able to handle this context. I had one choice, invite God into it, invite his life into it. I was incapable of handling this context. Don't ever be afraid of entering into a place that you can't handle. Because if we can handle it, we don't need him. I found myself being very weak in prayer. My prayer life has escalated. <laughs> because I have, I have to have him. I, this is beyond me. God's given me abilities. They're not things that I asked for in the womb. I didn't have a checklist. This is what I want. Lord, give me these abilities. I want to be able to do this, this, and this. They were from him. But I became dependent on those abilities as if somehow I generated them. And that's what I needed to be effective. And it left him out of the equation. In my mind, I was thinking I was, he was important. I've been trained that he was important, but I didn't embody that. My time with Life in the Hood eventually led us to co-found uh, with a, a couple in the, in the neighborhood as well that, that lived there. He had actually grown up there, uh, Legacy Community Development. And I want you to understand that, that sometimes people get excited about these organizations, these nonprofits, and it is exciting. I mean, it's exciting what the potential is and what these containers could do, but, but they're just the containers. The most important thing is the reason why we started it is because we wanted to, to, to be light in this community, to give opportunities for us to connect, to have relationships, to be able to share life together, to have that light actually be shining in relational contexts where it's life upon life. And so legacy community development is the container that we're using to try to create that and generate that and get help from outside sources as well as internally to do that so there can be some hope. There can be some movement that are letting people know we can break some of these generational cycles. We can live life differently. 
And then that conversation can develop and can become redemptive to the fullest extent. Understand that redemption can start in very small ways in, in, in contexts where there's hardly even any belief in God. In fact, there may even be anger with God. But the redemption starts in the fact that the life of Christ in us is present. I used to joke about, I recruit people to come, uh, people that are Christ followers, I, I recruit them to come live in my neighborhood. I call it when the saints come marching in. And the, the reason why I do that is because why wouldn't I want to recruit light to come into dark places so that people can experience that? But I've learned over the years that, that I have to be very careful because there are a lot similar to me, and I'm still this way sometimes, that are not safe to bring into dark places. And I want to challenge you. What do you need to do to be a safe person to someone that's come out of trauma? Someone that's lived in generational dysfunction beyond what we can wrap our minds around. Are you a safe person for that? And if, if, if you're not a safe person to enter into that and have those conversations and live life in those contexts, what's it going to take for you to become a person that would be safe for someone that's been through those types of circumstances, that's lived in that type of cycle of dysfunction and violence and poverty. So the, rea the reality check for all of us is we've got to deal with the radical ruin of the soul. If you have a, a, a sense that you are pretty much a good person or you have a sense that there are some good people in this world, we need to go back theologically and realize we have the image of God in us, and that is the key starting place. So there is the worth and the value stamped upon God, that stamped upon our lives by God himself that no one can change, not even you. You cannot alter your worth in any way, shape, or form. It's a done deal. However, sin has broken that. It's shattered that. It's damaged that. And we are conceived with that reality. And we've got to deal with that. And I read Dallas Willard's book, um, on renovation of the heart and he had a whole chapter dedicated to the radical ruin of the soul and it decimated me I was bawling I, I didn't want I, I didn't even want to I didn't want to read another line but I had to keep reading I didn't want to think about this reality I didn't want to think about the radical ruin of my soul and the souls of other people but it made sense for some of the things that had happened to me especially in my childhood it made sense it made sense that within this realm that we do the things that we do internationally, racially, because our souls are ruined. But immediately I had to go to the next chapter because the next chapter is the radical redemption of the soul. And you can't read those two chapters and you can't read Romans without coming to the conclusion that, wow, without Jesus Christ, All we can do is make life a little more comfortable for people who are going to spend eternity in hell. I want to give my best energy to that. What do I personally, apart from him, really have to offer? And am I even living life if I try to live it in any way, shape, or form apart from him? So I began to go through this journey of dealing with the radical ruin of the soul and how it not only impacts my life, but how it impacts the lives of people around me and why we do the things we do and, and, and what happens within my own neighborhood as well as uh, with other countries and some of the atrocities that have taken place in our history as Americans. And then to dwell on and meditate on and, and have my tears turn to tears of gratitude for the radical redemption of the soul permeates everything it affects the way we think it affects the way we feel it affects the way we look at life or the way we see things is now through kingdom eyes and now we are positioned to be people that God uses to be catalysts to create pathways of redemption for other people I cannot be the Holy Spirit I cannot convict others I've tried I have tried to be the Holy Spirit in many different contexts it doesn't work but I can I'm not going to limit this. I can and I am called to and I should and so should you. Create pathways to introduce, to connect, to help people understand redemption. Even if it's redemption from their circumstances initially, but ultimately the author of redemption and what it means to live life with him and live life with others who have also experienced the redemption of their souls. 
So what does it look like to create the pathways? First of all, you've got to confront sin. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but you've got to confront sin. It's, there, there are strongholds. Addiction is a sinful stronghold. And addiction comes in many different forms. It's just a popular term right now in, in, in regard to substances. And I'll tell you what, if you go to a recovery meeting, A-A-N-A, Celebrate Recovery, if, if people are really serious at that recovery meeting, it's like going to church, but better. I know that sounds terrible to say that, but the transparency, the honesty, the realization that they are powerless apart from their higher power. There's some, there some theology going on in those meetings. Whether they know it or not, whether they give credit to the, to the, to the author of those truths or not, it's still truth. It's powerful. It's transformational. And it's for all of us. Learn to walk with others through their reality. I had a question earlier about how do you enter into a conversation with someone without triggering their trauma? That's a really great question. Very sensitive and, and important question. But the best answer to it is that you develop a relationship with them first. And let the conversation flow out of that. If the two greatest commands that Jesus Christ gave us are to love God and love others, and understand he's not undermining all the things given in the Old Testament. He's summarizing them. The whole spirit of everything that has been given in terms of law is in regard to loving God and loving others. It's in regard to relationship. So if the two greatest commands are all geared toward a relationship with him vertically and a relationship with one another, then it makes sense that our best energy should go into building those relationships. And if we're going to walk with others through their reality, if we're going to love them according to Philippians 1.9 in a way that discerns what's best, not what makes you feel better, or you don't do this because you're afraid you're going to lose that person if you don't, that's not love. That's selfishness. That's self-serving on our part. And I have realized that I have done a lot in the name of ministry that is very self-serving. I had no idea until I moved into this neighborhood and started working. I've been working for 10 years with women coming out, coming out of the Clark County Jail, and I started having conversations with people on the street, and I actually entered into friendship with them. I had no idea how arrogant I was. And I, I, I would think I would take care of that arrogance, and then I'd find a whole other layer of arrogance and a whole other layer of arrogance. The the father of lies, Satan himself, has strongholds in our lives that we have got to deal with. And we've got to be sensitive to that, even as we get to a certain point and we feel like we've done the confession, and again, it's a process. And as you start to develop relationships, these two go hand in hand. You'll find yourself on your knees confessing once again, Lord, I didn't even know I had this arrogance. I would be driving down the street and I would see someone that was homeless or someone that was in obvious, obviously in, in, in bad circumstances. And I couldn't believe the initial thoughts that would come into my head. And they were usually something that was trying to tell me that I was, I was better because of my particular circumstances. And I don't know where those thoughts came from, but they obviously had been nurtured somewhere in my spirit for a long period of time because it would happen so quickly and so easily. And I would just ask God, please forgive me. Help me realize that the ground is level at the foot of the cross because I've said that for years in a classroom context, but I'm not embodying it. That's the process we all have to go through. It's humbling. But thanks be to God for his unspeakable gift. We need to get to the point where we were like Isaiah in Isaiah 6 and where we're like Paul saying, who will rescue me from this body of death? And once we get there, and we realize that he is the one that can rescue us from that body of death, and we thank him for his unspeakable gift and how redemption plays out in our lives moment by moment every day, then we can enter into real relationships with other people. It's love that discerns what's best. It's love with healthy boundaries but no judgment. And again, that arrogance it will bring judgment every time. So again, this is not something where you can say, okay, I don't have any judgment. You do have judgment. It, you just don't know how it's couched. It's in there somewhere. So always be alert because that judgment crushes people's souls. Humble friendship. 
Not only confessing so that you can enter into rich relationships with others, but also pursue lifelong healing. And, and again, we've talked about this. Sin, brokenness, we're incomplete, we're distorted, we're dysfunctional. Sin leads to chaos. So we need this new redemption, or this redemption, this new life, these healthy relationships. We need order in our lives. We need healing. There's a reason why Isaiah 53, 5 says, by his stripes we are healed. There's a reason why we're starting to talk about therapeutic communities, and that may sound like some new word, but really the bottom line is Jesus Christ wants us to be part of, always has, a group of people that put him first and say, Lord, we want to be whole. How do you get whole if you're not pursuing healing? And how can we help each other pursue wholeness? Healing is not a powerful moment or initial transformation. It is a lifelong endeavor in partnership with the very Spirit of God. We want to become more and more like the one who created us whole and perfect. He, get, he knows where we should be. So why would we not depend on him first and foremost? I've listened to so many voices in my head all my life and tried to please all these voices. And his keeps getting drowned out. It's not their fault. That's my fault. For not tuning in to the one who knows. He knows what it means for joy fake and to be whole. And he, not alone, because he wants to involve other people, but he primarily is the one that can lead me toward that. Healing is only possible when one feels safe. Safe in a relationship with him and supported by safe people. If you don't remember anything else, you need to remember that. When I trust that my God is safe for me, I can be transparent with him. And there is no one safer. No one. But then I also need a supportive community that's safe. And again, this is a lot of work on our part to create that. I'm not talking about being safe as in not being in the brutal messiness. I'm not talking about that kind of safe. I'm talking about a safe place to heal. We need to create that within our churches. We need to create that within our communities. We need to create that on campus. There should be no there should be no sin tendency that any person has on this campus that can't be talked about here. It's not, it's not fair. <laughs> and I'm not talking about fairness in the sense of, of um, cultural fairness. I'm talking about justice. There's nothing just about that. And there should be no... One of the things I struggle so much with people that, that, that are, are recovering from addiction to substances is they can't get past the label. There's a stigma on them, and people have a fear and a, 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 a prejudice, even when they try not to. That's not just. I've done it. So I'm not being judgmental about it, but I need to name it. I need to say that, and we need to name it. If there's anything here... Because we all have to be able to talk about our sinful tendencies. We all have to be able to talk about our favorite sins. And, and there needs to be, not everybody's going to be safe for every sinful tendency. So you need, to, you need to be wise in that and ask God to give you wisdom and lead you to safe places to be transparent. And to be that kind of person that other people can be that, can be safe with as well in sharing those things. By the way, um, Trusting God is very, very difficult, and earning trust with people who have been let down time and time and time again gives you a little taste of what God deals with with us. It is very hard to earn people's trust, and once you do, guard it. Trust is essential. It's essential for all relationships. Seek wisdom. So not only deal with our sins and, and also create those opportunities for healthy relationships, but seek wisdom every day we want to somehow have a manual for what it means to be a christ follower and even though we talk about it that we don't want that and we we there's something really in in a, in a not good word safe about having a manual <laughs> it's like new parents that just want to have that manual that says this is if you do this your kid's going to turn out okay it just doesn't work that way and god never intended it to be that way that's why it says in, the Pro in Proverbs over and over again, seek wisdom, cry aloud for insight, call out for discernment. If it were the same way for every person, then we wouldn't need wisdom. We wouldn't need relationship with him. We wouldn't need to pray about it. We wouldn't need to have faith that he would give us what we need for that situation and that person in that context in this time. 
There are things that we need to think through. Like it's not just enough to speak truth, but you've got to do it with grace. Jesus Christ was full of grace and truth. How do you fill a cup up with grace and then fill that cup up again with truth? The same cup. If it's already full, how do you fill it up twice? It's not possible. It's a supernatural act. To be full of grace and truth at the same time is to embody the very person of Jesus Christ. And it is not easy, and that's why we need him. It's his life in us that can be full of grace and full of truth. In this culture today, in the context and the times we find ourselves in, there's never been a time where we needed the fullness of grace and the fullness of truth like we do now. And I'm sure that other people have said that many, many times. It's what I feel right now. So understand this is more my emotion than it is the reality of it. But don't we feel that in our spirit in these times that we need grace and truth and we need people that can embody both of those equally in their fullness? That's Jesus Christ in us. How about empower versus enable? If you work with people coming out of addiction, you'll hear enablement all the time until you just want to throw up. You're so sick of hearing, don't enable, don't enable, don't enable. And it's true, you don't want to enable someone who's under the control of substances. But there's a fine line between enablement and empowerment, and it seems to change every day based on where they are, based on where you are, based on what the circumstances are, based on their drug of choice. Based on the culture, based on their support system. Again, we cry out for wisdom. Lord, help us. We don't want to enable people to make poor choices. But we also don't want to abandon them when most women are, are involved with substances mainly because of abandonment. So for the sake of love, we abandon them because we don't want to enable them. We're not willing to walk with them in these difficult circumstances, and we actually re-traumatize them over and over and over and over and over again. Wisdom. How do I have wisdom to deal with someone in these circumstances when I've never been in those particular circumstances? I've never walked in those particular shoes. I depend on the spirit of wisdom. I have to. When I don't, I screw up. I ask forgiveness. I'm grateful that I can ask forgiveness and actually receive it, that I'm not just talking off the top of my head, but I'm talking to a God who has earned the right to forgive. And I press on. I persevere. Speak truth without exercising power and coercion. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a white person standing here making that statement. You talk about racial injustice on this campus. Continue to. You talk about injustice in terms of gender, continue to. Because there is an unhealthy power that all of us wield from some place in our lives. And even if we come from a, from a marginalized or a disadvantaged context, sometimes we even use that as power over someone with compassion. Power is everywhere, the abuse of power is everywhere. But conviction and truth that are full of grace and love that's different than the abuse of power. It's very different. It comes from a whole different place. We have to think about that, and God give us wisdom to do that. Galatians 6 is confusing because it says, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. But then it says, but everyone must bear his own burden. Understand the wisdom of that. I can't make choices for other people. I can't strong arm them. I can't convict them. I can help lighten their load, but in the end, I'm... 100% responsible for the burden that God has called me to carry. And we have to keep that tension. How do we do it? Wisdom. And finally, excuses versus reasons. And I wish I'd save more time to talk about this, but people always say, especially with those, in, again, coming out of addiction, well, you're making excuses because you're not taking personal responsibility. Okay, so you were sexually abused. Get over it. Excuses means that you're not willing to take personal responsibility for your choices. Reasons mean I, have, I am taking personal responsibility, but there are reasons why this happened. There are reasons why I did what I did. There are reasons for why I'm in the position I'm in. You have to explore your reasons. You have to. You're called by God to explore your reasons. But don't make excuses because personal responsibility is essential. That's James 4 telling you, draw near to God and work through this. Cleanse your hands, purify your hearts, get after this. Take personal responsibility for your choices. There are so many active verbs in Scripture that God is telling us, I am calling you to take personal responsibility. Don't make excuses. But also, these reasons, God is a God of compassion. God is a God of justice. And exploring those reasons is critical. Time is 
not my friend right now, but I want to challenge you in terms of the basic ordinances, the two primary ordinances of Christianity from the early church to the present are baptism and communion. Let me give you a different look at these two things. Baptism is new life. I go in, I die to cry, I die to my sin, and I come out and I live in Christ. That's new life. We will spend the rest of our lives figuring out what happened when Jesus Christ redeemed us at, that, at the moment of salvation and when we embodied this through baptism. But communion, even more so, as we think about communion as an ongoing ordinance, is Jesus Christ taking his body and his blood symbolizing I'm sharing my life with you will you receive it every time you go to communion Jesus Christ is saying remember me and remember this I want to share my life with you I want my life to be in you Christ in you the hope of glory and then I want you to take that life I want you to continue to heal I want you to trust me I want you to feel safe in me and then I want you to share that life with others I want you to live that life with others I want you to be present with others even in very very dark situations Finally, embrace the body. I want you to think about something as we close here. What can this campus do with your different disciplines to come together and think of a solution to the brokenness in your context and say, okay, from a legal standpoint, from a social work standpoint, from a business standpoint, from a marketing standpoint, from an accounting standpoint, from a juvenile justice standpoint. I mean, name all the disciplines here. How can we come together and develop something holistic that's living life together that will help people be able to think redemptively and actually be on a pathway to redemption that could not do that alone? What would that look like? One of the things we're looking at right now, um, I don't know if it'll flow out of legacy. I don't, do not want to start another nonprofit, so I hope it does. But we want to get people out of the city for a period of time. And we want to get them on a farm and live off the land and have therapeutic things like animal, horses. Maybe I watch too much Heartland, but, you know, just have some way for them to be in a context where they can breathe in air, where they're not being tempted constantly. It's not right in their faces. What would that look like from an engineering standpoint? How could we do it in a way that's energy efficient and that would be uh, we, we could sustain it financially, and how would we market that and raise funds for it? And, and how would we do the day-to-day? -day? How do we connect them to social services? How do we do this? So I want to challenge you as, as the part of the body. In a world of specialization, which is what you do here, you specialize in particular majors. We desperately need to recommit ourselves to working together intentionally. We call it collaboration, but whatever word you want to use for it, that's the newfangled word. The bottom line is it still comes back to many parts of one body doing their work. So I just want you to think about that. I just want you to encourage you not to be soft on sin in your life or not to be soft on sin in the context in which you live, to be engaged in your own healing journey, to seek wisdom over everything else. Maybe it's not best for you to go out and buy a home that you can actually make the mortgage. Maybe you should buy a home where you're, you're going to be way over budget so you have more opportunities to be life-giving with your money, just as one example. Live simply so others can live. Evaluate your relationships. Are you sharing life with people? Or are you just kind of doing life side by side in your silos? Are you putting yourself out there? Are you willing to go beyond and, and be in dark places and, and live out redemption in places where you're not going to get a lot of warm fuzzies? It's going to be brutal. It's going to be messy. I'll tell you, the last thing I want to, to say to you is I, I believe in Christ in you, the hope of glory. I believe very strongly that God's doing a work in and through you and can do so much more if you're committed to the things we talked about today that are, that are just steeped in his word. I'm just communicating what he's already communicated. I believe you can shine like stars in the universe, and this is a very dark time. And I want to ask your forgiveness for the way my generation has not set you up very well for this in ways that we have let you down. I hope there are ways that we can be life-giving to you and, and turn that around to a great extent. Who here among us has not been broken? Who here among us is without guilt or pain? So oft abandoned by our transgressions. If such a thing as grace exists, then grace was made for lives like this. There are no strangers. There are no outcasts. There are no orphans of God. So many fallen, but hallelujah. 
There are no orphans of God. Thank you.